This is a checkpoint. Now, here's what's interesting. We all have guns, right? I don't have a gun, but my driver has a gun, my security guy has a gun, and they're looking for guns. And so they're going to search us. So now they start to, and then when I say, look, I'm an American, they kind of go, oh, well, then just go. Yes. No, y'all keep going. Huh? Where y'all from? I'm from LA. I'm CBS now. CBS? Yeah. There is a school of thought that says we should have given the citizens of Baghdad 48 hours to get out of Dodge and flatten the place. Then the war would be already over, and we could have done that in two days. One of the things that we don't want to do is to destroy the infrastructure of Iraq because in a few days we're going to own that country. Target Iraq. Operation Iraqi Freedom. All right, we're going to fix that uh, technical problem. Tick tock, it's time for a shock. Are you bored? It's time to get awed. ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, Fox News, breaking news, faking news, the media war. It's time to get sore. Wreak havoc and unleash the dogs of war. And there they start moving into Iraq. We got rockets coming in on us. Tom, we're under attack right now. PFC Jessica Lynch, who was being held. The battle for Basra is still raging along this The invasion of Iraq has invaded my brain. It's like I'm under attack. War is all I see. I dream of an endless desert. This is the beginning of the shock and Dissolving into bombs falling, into tanks rolling, into soldiers shooting, into people dying, into reporters reporting, if that's what they're really doing. This is the end. Beautiful friends. We have just a second crossed over the border into Iraq. Talk about embedding. Even my bed offers no escape from the 24-hour news cycle, spin cycle, Iraqi freedom cycle. The Pentagon has invaded my living room. Their generals have taken over my TV set. Is it news or propaganda? We're in this age of media mergers. Has the media merged with the military? You don't have to go into the jungle anymore to find the horror. It has come home. I feel like I'm living through my own media apocalypse, under fire on the polluted river of TV news. This is media war without end. I'm a media critic. My job to dissect the news. There were two wars going on in Iraq. One fought with soldiers, bombs, shock and awe. The other was fought alongside it with cameras, satellites, and armies of journalists. They were fighting a media war. That was the one I covered. Throughout the war, I was self-embedded at this computer, writing about media coverage worldwide for the MediaChannel.org website. Every day I read newspapers and magazines, sifted through websites, listened to the radio, and studied the TV coverage. Right in front of us, an amazing sight. Just like out of an action movie, but this is real. The war went on for 720 hours. I watched as much as I could stand and was not the only critical journalist. So was this journalism or was this coverage? There is a grand difference between journalism and coverage. And getting access does not mean you're getting the story. It just means you're getting one more arm or leg of the story. And that's what we got. Live coverage of a war is, I mean, to, to describe that as live journalism is, I think, an oxymoron. I think it's bad journalism. I saw the entire American media, print as well as uh, audio and video, was seduced by uh, this uh, run-up to the war. There was a, uh, an envelopment in the American flag, a patriotic sweep. Say what you like about Rupert Murdoch's Fox network, its strange intimacy with God and the US administration, but it takes real flair to put this on national television. Using the facilities, when there aren't any facilities, how are you going to the bathroom, buddy? <laughs> 
So the reporter called a soldier over. Do you want to demonstrate for us how you sit on that shovel? No. You want me to do it? Go ahead. There you go. That, there you go. Isn't that something? In the second back of the book segment today, a book called The More You Watch, The Less You Know. With us is the author of The More You Know, Danny Schechter, who has had many TV news jobs, including being a producer for 2020. So Years ago, I became a network refugee, challenging the superficiality of mainstream news, especially in its treatment of war. Even when covering wars in Vietnam and Cambodia, I also critiqued the coverage. I did the same when I worked at CNN and ABC News, and then with colleagues on Global Vision's TV series about South Africa that told unreported stories. Ditto for human rights coverage of Bosnia and Saddam's terrible crimes and abuses. Warring with the reporting of war has been an obsession for years. I lambasted media failures during all the hoopla around the first Gulf War. The majority is saying, thumbs up, you know, and I like that. So here I go again. UPI cameraman Abe Keller pinned down with the GIs, took these dramatic scenes while the dead and dying cover the floor, seat. It was this history of covering wars that led me to look at the relationship between the media and the military. To understand why people rally around the flag the way they do, you have to consider the information that shapes their opinions and impressions. How wars are covered or covered up is key. I can say without reservation that these magnificent young Americans are as fine as any fighting men our nation has ever sent into battle. The Pentagon's efforts to control press coverage were a response to the loss of the war in Vietnam. Many of the military to this day believe that the media coverage was responsible for America's defeat, not the armed forces or the policy. In that era, reporters were far more aggressive in exposing war crimes and duplicity. Peter Arnett was one of them. In Vietnam, the reporters did not get on the team. Uh, we challenged generals, governments, we challenged their, we demanded their accountability, challenged their findings. Vietnam is seen by the right wing as a war in which the American media sold out to the communist side. Well, you should be a pain in the ass. I mean, any reporter in a time like Vietnam, you, I mean, you ought to be a pain in the ass because that's when it counts. Generally, it's my belief that Richard Nixon was much more of a national security threat to the United States than any reporter I know. After Vietnam, the Pentagon limited media access to its wars while improving outreach to journalists with training exercises like this. I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm really busy. I need to attend to these people. Remember everything you say is on the record. And camera's off, doesn't matter. It's on the record. You say it, it can be used. Man, basically all the soldiers here are heroes in one way or another. Wars may destroy people and countries, but they can be profitable to cover. CNN won the 1991 Gulf War in the sense that its coverage propelled a struggling cable news operation known in the industry as the Chicken Noodle Network into a top global news brand. Revenues followed as ratings soared. Iraqi forces in Kuwait. Iraq claims the attack is failing. And so did patriotic fervor. Even as media objectivity eroded, that old truism, truth is the first casualty in war, was never more true. Iraqi forces in Kuwait. Journalists were denied access to most of the 1991 Gulf War, writes CNN's Christian Amanpour. Some of the killing fields. Behind our backs, behind the backs of the field reporters, field producers, and crews on the ground, our bosses made a deal with the establishment to create pools, what I call ball and chain, handcuffed, managed news reporting. The result, we later learned the smart bombs used then were not so smart. Only one out of five hit targets. Most U.S. casualties were caused by friendly fire. I've covered enough wars to be able to, in a position to say this, that we have never, I, have, including me, have never shown the viewer what it's really like what, and how horrible war is. Um, and 
and, and partly you can't show it because the camera can't capture it, but even at a certain level the camera may capture it and we won't show it. There are certain kinds of close-ups that we won't show. There are certain blood spatters, dead children that, that we don't show people, partly because it, it violates sort of long-standing practice, don't put gore on television. The coverage of the Gulf Wars lacked more than gore. Context and background were missing. Like the role the U.S. played in putting Saddam Hussein in power and arming him for years. America's war on Iraq did not end with the end of that war. Washington initiated and the U.N. imposed sanctions, which coupled with the cruelty of Saddam's regime, reportedly led to a million children dying and the spread of new diseases. A mysterious Gulf War syndrome struck veterans. The US and Britain imposed no-fly zones, using them as a cover for warlike bombing raids years before the 2003 invasion. None of these stories received the full coverage they deserved. And then came 9-11. The Bush administration used the attack as a pretext to put in place secret plans to invade Iraq drawn up before 9-11. The media was mobilized behind the war on terror. In post-9-11 America, a patriotic correctness swept through the news business. TV Refused anchors put flags in their lapels. I wrote a book showing how the coverage advanced the government's plan to respond militarily. Some stories explaining why they hate us gave way to this. It all became uh, very personal at 9-11. I was in command of my battalion at the time. I mean, I was in the training meeting when that happened, the, um, the unspeakable acts against pillars of our strength being um, you know, hit by aircraft. You can imagine what it was like. It all became you know, very, very personal. Much of the coverage fueled demands for retaliation. There was often more debate in the streets than on TV. The same hatred that killed so many people. Many networks said they didn't want to get ahead of public opinion or be baited as soft on terrorism. They don't love me, and I don't love them, okay? Okay. This confrontation at Ground Zero in New York shows what happened when a peace activist called for global understanding. What about us? Do you care about every human being here? It's September 11th. You're at Ground Zero. If they do something to us, then we're not going to do they, nothing that's back. The point. They but we're not going to do nothing they back. They didn't do anything. To, Iraq did not do shit to America. Yeah. So you're saying it's okay to kill innocent yeah. people? Listen, if it's for a better good, if it's for a better good, let's do it. Yeah, I volunteered. You know why? To keep your ass free. To keep your hippie ass free. He puts his life on the line. Don't forget the American media is based in New York City. Every reporter in New York City saw the World Trade towers collapsed. They took it personally. There was a sense of revenge, of fear, and that was reflected in the coverage of the Afghanistan war and the war on terrorism. We may be wrong about some of the things we're passing along. CBS's Dan Rather, September 22, 2001. I am willing to give the president and the military the benefit of any doubt. As we moved into Iraq, a more preemptive strike, the media maintained this sort of romance, you might say, with government. But the fact that um, they allowed the Bush administration to manipulate the truth so grossly and so nakedly in the run-up to the war uh, made the war possible. The United States of America will not permit the world's most dangerous regimes to threaten us with the world's most destructive weapons. All the while, Washington insisted Iraq had to be disarmed, that it had proof that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction that threatened the world. Saddam Hussein recently sought significant Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities The demonization of Saddam Hussein went on for five months. During the run-up to the Iraq war, American media outlets, including most TV networks and the New York Times, relayed the administration's spin on the threat posed by Iraq without much question. Without their cheerleading, there could have been no consensus for war. 
In May 2004, the New York Times acknowledged its pre-war reporting had been deeply flawed. A Times editor called it an institutional problem, indicting editors and reporters who, quote, coddled sources and practiced hit-and-run journalism. He admitted that America's self-styled newspaper of record had not just reported the story but become part of it. Quote, covering the war was not the Times at its best. Only now, we're, you know, of course we're learning so much of the stuff that we simply assumed must be accurate. Doesn't, it wasn't accurate at all. The Amsbundsman of the Washington Post later admitted, it's clear now that the press as a whole did not do a very good job in challenging administration claims. Critical perspectives, perspectives about alternatives to war, um, all the kind of efforts and discussion of the peace movement virtually disappeared from the media at that very point where notionally a society was making up its mind as to whether to go to war or not. The media monitoring group Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, or FAIR, studied 1,617 on-camera sources between March 20th and April 9th, 2003. They found 71% of all sources were pro-war, only 3% anti-war. I mean, I saw a figure the other day of something like, I forgot the exact figures, but something like there were 800 experts used during the war on, a, on all the American broadcast outlets, and only six were opposed to the war. Now, that seems a pretty odd state of affairs. In this period, I was hoping war would be averted. UN deliberations were covered, but dismissively. International opinion was not taken seriously. The media frame became us versus them. There was a buzz here for many weeks. One journalist told me that buzz is gone. Instead, there's a pall, a feeling of total frustration. The United Nations wanted to give the arms inspectors time to finish the job, but the Bush administration bypassed the UN, claiming to act in its name by launching a preventive war, unilaterally, as an act of self-defense. Britain and a few other nations joined what was officially branded a coalition of the willing. Critics called it a coalition for the drilling. The United Nations survived this failure. The United Nations is more important than ever. We need collective responsibility. We need when countries like France called for more UN inspections, they were denounced as cheese-eating surrender monkeys in some media outlets. And despite the fact that we have no weapons of mass destruction, the U.S. armies have crossed the Atlantic and they are preparing hundreds of thousands of other soldiers. The United States insisted they were there. What happened to those weapons? Well, I think uh, it has been destroyed. It has been destroyed by the Iraqi government because they felt at that time that there is no need for it. Anyway, they cannot use it because if they would like to use these chemical weapons, the other side will destroy the whole Iraqi people, the whole Iraqi country. So I think they did realize that, and for this reason they destroyed it. And they destroyed it earlier, 91, 92. This claim, ridiculed by the media then, is largely accepted now. An exhaustive March 2004 University of Maryland study on the coverage of WMDs found that threat was exaggerated, reported inaccurately, and irresponsibly. After the invasion phase of the war ended, journalists debated their role in fueling a war climate. The run-up to the war, the run-up to the war was extremely well covered. The run-up to the war was one side. Because most, that's, that's what we voted because on. Most of the, because on one panel, Harper's Rick MacArthur challenged Time Magazine's Michael Elliott. Afterwards, I spoke with both. Is it the news culture? Is it the lack of critical thinking? Is it, is it uh, economic interests? Well, is it all of It's both? all those things, but it's mostly owners who don't care about journalism. I think the American media has done a fabulous job since September the 11th. Wasn't this a media system that was cheerleading for the war? I think undoubtedly what you saw in the war was a sharper distinction 
between the print media and the TV media than I've ever seen before. Or maybe I should have said that in the session just now. we got to watch what they say. If Michael Elliott gets up there and says, yeah, time, time didn't do a very good job covering the war or covering the run-up to the war, he's out of a job. He's going to get in trouble with his bosses. I can say it because I'm a publisher. In the run-up to war, dissent was marginalized, debate was limited, protest and protesters are seen but rarely heard. More than a million demonstrators turned out in London, the largest thought to be the largest ever in Great Britain. Sadly, the coverage was at its worst in the period when it mattered most. The period bracketed by the worldwide demonstrations on February the 15th and actually going to war was one in which British public opinion turned round from being approximately 60-40 against the war to approximately 60-40 in favour of the war. Washington Post Amsbundsman Michael Gettler blasted his own paper for under-reporting or poorly displaying coverage of big demonstrations here and abroad. There was a fairly decent coverage of the fact that there was an anti-war movement. What there was not decent coverage was, was the analysis uh, of what, our, what we were trying to say about what was wrong with the war, why we never should have gone to war, why the war needed to end, uh, what was driving the, the, so the, the motor force behind the war. That analysis never got into the mainstream media. It was freezing in New York during the huge February demonstration. I think it's ironic it's taken George W. Bush to, re to sort of uh, revive the progressive movement in the United States and Western Europe. South Africa's Bishop Tutu was a featured speaker. What do we say to peace? The mainstream media sort of ghettoizes this kind of coverage and doesn't allow it to really enter into the mainstream discourse. I think they'll, they'll report it, they'll show the crowds as a mass, they might show some sound bites, but they won't really get into like what the significance of this movement is. Later protests, I spoke with journalists and activists about the coverage we were then being bombarded with. The purpose of journalism is to question the prevailing wisdom. The journalism we see in this country, for the most part, in the mainstream media, does not question anything. And that scares me to think that here it is, it's a war, people's lives, the whole world is changing, and most of us are just watching it like another entertainment channel. If we invade Iraq, there's a United Nations estimate that says there will be up to a half a million people killed or wounded. Do we have the right to do that to a country that's done nothing to us? Frozen out of the news, activists tried to buy airtime for anti-war commercials like this. No nation under God has that right. It violates international law. It violates God's law. Most networks wouldn't run the spots, even for the money. Many activists soured on mainstream news, turning to hundreds of internet sites. They also turned to foreign TV outlets, especially the BBC. Many young people abandoned the news altogether, preferring satirical newspapers like The Onion and comedy news shows. Many turn to alternative and independent media. Well, it's up to the media to challenge those in power, not to cozy up to power. So you have this media that's embedded now in the government, in the military, and yet at the same time there's hope because there is a response to that, and that is the independent media movement. A global news army was put in place before war erupted. On all sides of the conflict, media outlets were spun or controlled by governments. In Baghdad, mainstream journalists say it was tough to get the truth. Sometimes independent reporters were able to do better. 
Uh, every foreigner is followed by the secret police, but journalists are watched even closer. And there was an army under Saddam Hussein of government officials whose only job it was to, it was to spy on journalists. So you have no way to avoid being under the control of the Iraqi Ministry of Information. They tapped my phone in my office, my hotel room. There was a small camera in my hotel which watched my every movement. Um, I used to have to go into the loo to get changed. <laughs> I determined that the best thing was to not get accreditation as a journalist in my visa and to go in as a humanitarian worker. They are not near Baghdad. Don't believe them. They are nowhere. This is silly. <laughs> Iraq's media minders worked for the Minister of Information, Mohammed al-Sahaf, known in the West as Comical Ali, for his false claims. Most of his threats of Iraqi resolve were treated as a joke. Later, as resistance emerged, some now seem almost prophetic. The bribery system was appalling. Uh, some television crews were paying up to $5,000 per visa. So in the case of Rupert Murdoch, he has you know, a tremendous number of media outlets, probably the most of any single company or person in the world, operating in Iraq under Saddam Hussein. And uh, one uh, colleague who works in a Murdoch uh, news operation estimated that Rupert Murdoch was giving as much as a half a million dollars to Saddam Hussein's government during the lead up to the war, just for permission for his news outlets to operate there. And there was a running joke that Rupert Murdoch was the second greatest source of cash for Saddam Hussein, second only to oil smuggling. There are pockets like to Crete. Mm -hmm. there are if Iraqis like were corrupt, so were some Western media outlets. New York Times correspondent John Burns and others accused Western media companies of competing through corruption, literally buying access for their correspondents and cameras while not covering human rights abuses and the suffering of the people. CNN later admitted it did not report abuses of its own staff members in order to keep its office open in Iraq. F-18 Street in Few of the journalists who covered the war covered the way it was really covered. Independent reporter Robert Young Pelton, author of this best-selling travel book to the world's most dangerous places, had his eye on the media eye. There was never any sense that we might go to war. It was always like, we're going to attack Saddam Hussein, and here's why. There was very much a script on how this war was handled. There was a kickoff. Saddam Hussein and his sons must leave Iraq within 48 hours. And then there was a countdown. You got 48 hours to get out of town. Then it was like everybody tuned in for the opening kickoff. As the war progressed, it was done on a linear scale. We're going from here to there. It was almost like we're running a pass. There were people actually drawing diagrams, generals drawing diagrams on a map that looked just like a football play. You know, we're going to go sneak around here, and we're going to do this, and we're coming up there, and we're doing that. This sports metaphor offered a simplified narrative, mimicking a familiar TV format. When Pelton was delayed getting into Iraq, his focus became the press. So I s ended up being the only person embedded with journalists during the war in a fancy hotel in Jordan. Right now there's apparently 4,000 journalists everywhere from Kuwait to Baghdad to Jordan to Syria to Turkey, all waiting for the war to start. And some of these people have been sitting around for nine weeks. They lived in very nice hotels. They were all on expense accounts. They met at the bar every night. They work 24 hours a day. The president will address the nation at 10.15. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. The level of protection would be minimal, and if I were a news president or a news executive right now, I would be pulling my people out. When the war had finally begun, the networks began pulling their reporters out of Baghdad. Peter Arnett was in the Iraqi capital with a National Geographic documentary team. He decided to stay. Covering wars are a dangerous business. You can die, and those companies feel responsible for their people in harm's way. They sometimes order them out. I think there is something to be said for staying. However, from a news executive standpoint, 
The risks are enormous. I sort of have a genetic tick that allows me to go into dangerous areas without too much concern. The interesting thing was is that the American military were trying to intimidate these journalists. They were saying, you know, you're going to be a target and everything. And the journalists were working overtime to say, look, we're here, we're, this is our coordinates, don't fire here. And everybody knew the journalists were at these hotels. That's why they were at these hotels. It was also known that if you're going to have shock and awe, you need somebody to record it. I mean, the one thing that they left out was the, they needed the media to fight this war. The war was set up to be filmed and recorded by the media. So there was this bizarre symbiotic relationship. When the awesome bombing of Baghdad began, what was shocking was the way news anchors lovingly described lethal weapons. They became boys with toys. Should they have used more? Should they, you know, use a Moab, the mother of all bombs, and a few daisy cutters? And, you know, let's not just stop at a couple of cruise missiles. <laughs> yeah, only Craig, I want to huh? see him use that Moab. Action to begin. CBS's David Martin at the Pentagon is following the planning and has the latest on a possible time. To promote its war, the Pentagon made media management a priority. Their strategy was sophisticated, clever, and almost always covert. Few media outlets exposed it. Most participated willingly for their own political and economic reasons. Pentagon strategy went beyond traditional PR, using marketing strategies and perception management. Administration officials likened their war planning to a product rollout. It was all to guarantee there would be only one storyline in the media and in the minds of Americans, theirs. A Pentagon advisor told me it was intentional. They knew that TV networks prefer storytelling to sloganizing. Their storyline became a master narrative, defining Iraq as the problem and U.S. military intervention as the only solution. Traditionally, propaganda is targeted at the enemy. In this war, it was smoothly infiltrated into the news, aimed at American and global public opinion. There are known knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we don't know. This platform is not a platform for propaganda. This is a platform for truth. In his war plan, Tommy Franks, the U.S. military commander, described the press, once known as the Fourth Estate, as the Fourth Front. He knew that a supportive media was essential for victory and he cultivated one. This will be a campaign unlike any other in history. The Pentagon focused on winning the media war, leaking their plan to reporters they could trust. We knew the plan, and I think the military benefited as far as positive coverage during the war, because we knew what the plan was. So we reported that things basically were on plan, or we weren't worried when we got delayed two or three days because we, we knew overall it was very successful. Earlier, when the media pressed for access, Frank's team came up with the idea of embedding reporters. A former corporate PR professional turned Pentagon official ran the program. One of the things we did, it wasn't rocket science, but it was hard work. We took the same kind of planning and training and discipline that you put into military operations and put it into this aspect of the military operations. And Rumsfeld and Myers being enlightened guys had included people like me in the war planning from the very earliest stages. But Tory Clark got uh, major networks and news organizations to sign a 12-page contract agreeing to certain ground rules that actually kept the Department of Defense, public affairs people in the driver's seat. And you got reporters in with these young idealistic troops who really believed all the spin of what was going on. We were going to liberate Iraq that the reporters would overall identify with the troops and their reporting would be very positive. On the journey, or when we get there, any sort of incident happens, please keep calm and remain on the bus. We will deal with the situation, no matter what it is, as swiftly as possible. What or, or news organization are you with, Tim? Um, Sat 1, German television network. BBC. CNN. Los Angeles Times. Japan Broadcasting Corporation. I'm Gwendolyn Cates, and I'm here on assignment for People Magazine, and I'm embedded with the 200, the 205th Battalion, 165th. I was the only journalist embedded with a military intelligence unit. They were part of the 5th Corps based in Germany. 
and I was invited, in fact, to be embedded by this unit because one of the commanders had gotten to know me and felt that I could be trusted and would really tell the story. These are your atropine injector kits. Should you become uh, contaminated and start to feel the symptoms... Pentagon the put the embeds through a training course, ostensibly to teach them how to survive, but it went further. Hold it on there, so, so when you pull it tight... Journalists were given exaggerated fears of chemical attack designed to reinforce the threat of Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. The propaganda was also aimed at the military. It was a threat that wasn't there. Good to go. You look lovely. <laughs> I lived, ate, slept with the soldiers. And the bond that was established between us was very, very strong and very personal. And we shared the sandstorms together and the lack of food. And people talked to me about their fears and their children had left behind and their, their fear of death, all those things. Now that's a piece of equipment. So I became very personally involved with them as individuals. At the same time, I was observing this with journalistic detachment, but I did place their safety above any sort of journalistic responsibility I had, professional responsibility I had, and I would not have done anything to endanger any of them. What we're saying is, help us tell the truth. Unmentioned by most media, the plan actually betrayed an earlier agreement made after the first Gulf War that said, quote, open and independent reporting will be the principal means of coverage. The Pentagon signed off on that policy on March 1st, 1992. There's an interesting issue of conflict of interest there because one of the standard rules of journalistic ethics is that journalists should not accept anything of value from the source they're covering. Well, all of their transportation and indeed their very lives were being uh, protected by the soldiers they were covering. And how old are you? I'm 21. What's your birthday? The 10th, 81. Because we want to send you a birthday card. How do you spell your last name? When I was there, it's funny because I was not so much scared for myself. I thought, what, what will I, how will I be able to handle it if one of my soldiers dies or is injured? I kept thinking about that. How will I be able to handle it? The idea of embedding is essentially the Stockholm Syndrome. If you take an unarmed individual and put him amongst armed people, he becomes sympathetic to their cause. So the idea was, look, slap a helmet on these guys, stick them in a Jeep or a Humvee, hit them in that direction, and let them do whatever the heck he wants, and he will become sympathetic to our cause. Many embeds did a conscientious job, but they could only provide a limited and ultimately misleading picture. The debate from the left and right about embedding from the left that these were going to be lapdogs of the Pentagon, from the right that this was going to be loose lips sinking ships, I think neither proved to be true. But we haven't had the debate about what the embedding process did to our understanding of the war. Please stay down, stay down. Uh, far too many journalists were gung-ho about covering the war. Some romanticized it, seduced by the spirit of adventure. Others sought glory, as Canada's CBC explained in a stunning special, Deadline Iraq. During the war, no U.S. network ran anything like it. I think so many journalists have this fascination. Uh, I must do this, and then I can call myself a war correspondent the rest of my life. It's as if they've got a checklist of things to do in their life, and this is one of them. But they are absolutely not prepared for the reality. People didn't want to miss this war, and it had a lot to do with, with, with people's career. There was no question. This is a thrill ride if you want to turn it into a thrill ride. I mean, you can, you can go to places in order to get shot at, in order to have the excitement of feeling what it's like to get shot at. I mean, you can go play in the traffic, too, if you want. There were few embeds with the military planners, with the covert action teams, the CIA, special ops, or with the air war. The U.S. military units that did the most damage were covered the least. I mean, it looks like this was disinformation at the highest levels. Later, CNN's Christiane Amanpour admitted her own network muzzled the news. ...is all about. Yes, I think the press was muzzled, and I think the press self-muzzled. 
I'm sorry to say, but certainly television and perhaps to an extent my station was intimidated by the administration and its foot soldiers at Fox News. And it did, in fact, put a climate of fear and self-censorship in my view in terms of, of the kind of broadcast work we did. Talk about letting people know that ratings have gotten under your skin. Um, nothing could be further from the truth, obviously, and I'll let the, the news media defend themselves, but I promise you 5, 10, 15 years from now, people who study these things will say, you never saw such real, you never saw such accurate, you never saw such hard-hitting coverage of military conflicts. A week later, I CNN hired the Pentagon's media flack, Victoria Clark, as an on-air contributor. It seems the gunfire has been coming from the police station down here. I think a lot of journalists did lose courage. A lot of embed journalists did lose their ability to be critical, uh, to emphasize the fact that there may be problems going on here because they didn't want to be kicked off the team. They wanted to stay embedded, and I think that was part of the problem. Look, you do what you can do with what you're given, you know, and I did the best I could with my assignment covering the 2nd Brigade. I think overall, if you have, what were there, 600 journalists embedded throughout, um, that is definitely a plus. By and large, the people who were covering the story, who were there at the front lines actually doing the actual reporting, did an admirable job. They were doing what they were sent out to do. However, they don't have ultimate control. The control someplace else. The control might be back in, in Washington or New York or in Edit Bay in Qatar or Kuwait City. Once this war started, we wanted the United States to win. We got to know these soldiers as people, and we wanted them to be successful. If the Pentagon had an agenda, the networks had one too, and it went beyond attracting audiences. When I worked in network news here at ABC, I watched the closing of foreign bureaus, the downgrading of documentaries, the dumbing down of news. There's nothing like the scary threat of WMDs and a good war to provide the basis for action-oriented TV coverage. Time magazine's Saddam cover was modeled on an earlier Hitler cover. Bush was presented as the avenging angel. War is one of those action-oriented spectacles that TV news lives for and thrives on in a post-journalism era. All the networks wanted to have was a countdown to war. If you looked at every single network, it was virtually indistinguishable. 48 hours to war, dun, 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 showdown to Saddam. With encouragement from the Pentagon, the news networks fashioned their coverage to maximize production values, to make it exciting. Time magazine called the approach militainment. Journalist Robert Pelton describes how it was done. I was in some of the initial phone meetings between New York and the people in the field. And this was being set up like a movie shoot. There was a channel called Best of the Bombs. And this is exactly what it was called, Best of the Bombs. And every piece of good footage from any network would be tossed onto this feed. It's a satellite feed. So if you're doing a story about, hi, I'm, I'm standing in the middle of nowhere, and let's roll to the footage, you would have this feed that had only good explosions. Secondly, they, were told, they told people, take your camera off the stick. We want to have that cinema verite look. You know, move it around, move it around. We want to see where you are. We want you to walk and talk and make people feel that you're in the middle of something. This is true. A Defense Department memo urged military commanders to encourage action coverage. Quote, use of lipstick and helmet-mounted cameras on combat sorties is approved and encouraged to the greatest extent possible. If you were to pick a generality, they were there for the big story. And, and keep in mind that Iraq is unusual because in the early days of CNN, one of the most memorable images were people like Peter Arnett sitting on a rooftop calling the war like a football game. This is the sixth cruise missile that have come over our heads in the last half hour. But the entire population of the planet focused on one journalist. So this was a wet dream for any journalist that went to Iraq, to be in that spot for a well-known predicted war to happen. If you're the guy holding that microphone and that thing happened behind you, that's what you're known for. You're not known for careful research for, uh, you know, it's the face. It's all about the face. And where that face is, is the measure of who you are. So they were looking to get bullets flying, bombs going off, and that microphone and then face on TV. Till freedom is a rumor. News
And that's what generates money. I mean, you look at who moved up the food chain in the journalism world over the last four or five years, you have basically two fast tracks. You have entertainment or war. And entertainment, who cares? If you're a journalist, really, you focus on war. The networks worked over time to produce so-called video enhancement elements, like graphics, promos, and special music. I want you to know Eyewitness News is there for you. We are working on the front line. Over here. They were preparing for what they called news immersion. Their war was for ratings and revenues. A CNN graphics designer in Atlanta confided to a friend that he was told to sex it up. Bombs don't work. That's correspondent Bill Neely of Britain's ITN. War coverage soon developed its own routines with anchors tossing to constant updates from embed reporters and in-studio analysis by network generals. One result, glitzy, round-the-clock, fast-paced coverage that was often misleading, inaccurate, and rarely corrected. Just more militainment. From the headlines. These entertainment values stimulated a demand for even more excitement from video game makers like KumaWar.com, who turned the war into an interactive commercial experience. experience of actual news events occurring around the world right now. Through British eyes, the U.S. channels lack journalistic distance. By and large, in the American networks, you would hear people talking about we. We, as though the American actual, the network was actually in the war. In the States, as far as I can ascertain, there is a presumption that politicians are right and honest and truthful. Um, you know, that is the default from which everything else operates. Some UK journalists like John Pilger and Robert Fisk opposed the war. Others felt constrained. If, say, for example, you cease to base your news agenda on the words and deeds of official sources, of the Prime Minister, of the government, and start to base it instead on gathering alternative perspectives, on gathering news from unconventional sources, then you will be somehow exposing yourself to the risk that you'll be accused of bias. Even as the military encouraged action coverage, Pentagon advisor John Rendon recognized the dangers. There's a convergence of content. News, information, and entertainment needs to be separated. Uh, right now, there's a blurring of the lines on all three. And if you can think about it just in terms of how music comes up under news pieces as a form of, of dramatization, it changes the dynamic. And if the vehicle that delivers this information is all the same, then the viewer, the, listen, the listener, or the reader will find a hard time distinguishing between the three. Undaunted, the channels produced branding liners, some taking the government campaign theme, the war for Iraqi freedom, as their own. One proposal to call the war Operation Iraqi Liberation was discarded because that spells oil. It's Operation Iraqi Liberation. Tell me, what does that spell? Operation Iraqi Liberation. O-I-L. We're about 10 miles from the Pentagon in Virginia at the home of a retired Air Force colonel who's been investigating the stories of the Iraq war, how they were manufactured, distorted, and misrepresented by the media. Well, I heard things, I uh, heard military guys say things about the Iraqis that uh, there's something wrong here. Sam Gardner, I'm a retired Air Force colonel, and I have taught strategy and military operations at the National War College, at the Air War College, uh, at the Naval War College. Gardner did a study that reads like the Pentagon Papers of the Iraq War. He and others revealed how information dominance promotes strategic influence, how it drove the Bush administration's preemptive war, using deceptive information as an integral component of military and political combat. This goes beyond just influencing what we think. It aims at controlling what we think about. Corporations seek market share. This administration sought mind share. 
share. Every morning at 9.30, they would have the message phone call, and it would involve the White House Office of Global Communications, the Pentagon Press Office, a media advisor, the people at Central Command, and sometimes the people in the State Department. And their notion for that day was to coordinate the message. And after that, they would talk to the Brits so that the message in London matched the message in Washington. One message, one idea, push it out into the media. Right. Dominate today's message with, and you can almost identify by day what the message with. Every day there was live coverage from the Pentagon's high-tech media center in Doha, built by a Hollywood set designer. Wouldn't it be reasonable for something? Unknown to most TV viewers, the White House directly stage managed the Doha Media Center through Jim Wilkinson, a Republican operative who had worked for a right-wing congressman and then helped run the Bush media operation in Florida in 2000. That strategy included staging events such as this anti-vote recount protest in Miami. It looked like a public protest, but it was actually led by right-wing campaign staffers. Jim Wilkinson. This is the guy that they put in charge of the media operation. He's the guy that engineered it. He's the guy that thought of all these things. Houston Chronicle reporter Harvey Rice watched him in action. He was nothing more than a political commissar. I mean, this is straight out of Stalin. And that's what he was there for. He was there to make sure the military, and as he put it in his first, he, uh, he, he said, I'm here to keep them on message. So he was running the information about the war like a political campaign. After the war, Wilkinson was brought back into the White House and then picked to run media at the 2004 Republican convention. A missile attack on the residential section of Baghdad that killed 14 civilians. Can you confirm that? So we think it's entirely possible that uh, this may have been, in fact, an Iraqi missile that either went up and came down or War watchers may remember media writer Michael Wolf challenging media briefers at the Central Command. Why should we stay? What's the value to us for what we learn at this uh, million-dollar press center? Wolf was later told to shut the fuck up by a military briefer. Sometimes it's your, your, your jaw drops, um, and, and it's hard to figure out why. Why are um, American journalists so... Um, maybe not even um, uncritical, self-satisfied, I, I think is the word. So the first day of the war, it's on CNN, where they've got this bank of cameras there, and everybody goes in, they're watching uh, explosions and tanks rolling across and, and, and guys with M-16s, M-14s, and, and we go, is the war started? And, and these PR guys there, and, and the one guy I talked to, he said, I'm sorry, we, I, I can't talk to you about that. I don't want to endanger the lives of our boys. I said, but it's on television. <laughs> if you can give the media more content than they can handle, and as far away from the battlefield as possible, they will focus their energies where the, the source of that fire hose is. So Doha is the center of the fire hose. And the idea is that you simply have press conferences every day, and every once in a while you throw a little tidbit out, you hand out videotapes, free coffee, whatever, so that if you leave, you're going to miss the story that everybody else is covering. Fire hose coverage and fire hose delivery blots out all the secondary source. My research of the threads of stories from the war, which takes it from the beginning through the end, uh, the way they were created, the way they were used, the way they were repeated, um, that research leads me to say that there were 50 or 60 stories that were either created or manipulated for the purposes of distorting the truth. Gardner cited false stories, like the link between Saddam and al-Qaeda as well as the Jessica Lynch story, which the BBC also debunked. What were the two narratives? The American narrative, as well known, is uh, the great hero who, uh, the great heroine who was captured under fire, 
who was then taken to hospital, potentially mistreated. American Special Forces went in, all guns blazing, rescued her against hostile fire. There was no resistance. The Iraqi doctors had been caring for her, given the circumstances, as well as could have been. And a lot of the um, more dramatic elements of this story uh, may have been embellished. That story ended up hanging around for about a week, and that's why she's called a hero. Well, it turns out all of that was wrong. When Rumsfeld was asked about this the next day, uh, he refused to comment on it, although I know he knew that she had not been shot, stabbed, and emptied her weapon on the bad guys. So it's, it hung around. Information dominance requires censorship. Little attention was paid to U.S. weapons that caused mass destruction, like legally prohibited cluster bombs that target civilians. It was a cluster bomb. The bomb with multiple mini bombs is dropped from an aircraft focusing on targeted areas. South African viewers learned about how cluster bombs worked and what damage they caused. An underreported fact, half of Iraq's population is under the age of 15. These young people became a primary target. This is what Baghdad's pediatric hospital looked like, floor after floor of cluster bomb survivors. This was filmed not by a network, but by independent filmmaker Patrick Dillon. Human Rights Watch reported cluster weapons caused hundreds of civilian casualties like these. There was extensive use of napalm-like Mark 77 firebombs. It was denied at first, but then admitted. More onerous was the almost total blackout on the use of radioactive depleted uranium, which hardens anti-tank weapons. This is especially ironic in light of Washington's constant claims of an Iraqi nuclear threat. The issue was covered overseas. Arnim Stauf, a German journalist, documented this proliferation in an Emmy Award-winning report for ARD in Germany. Wissen Sie, dass gerade dieser Panzer hier radioaktiv ist? Nein, da ist nichts, sagt der Soldat, überhaupt nichts. Aber wir haben es gemessen. Nein, er ist nicht radioaktiv, dieser Panzer sowieso nicht. Er ist mit Uranmunition abgeschossen worden. Sorry, ich muss jetzt weitermachen. In the British back office, a list of the BBC subjects. took viewers into a back room at the Coalition Media Centre. On the wall, a list of subjects briefers were ordered to avoid. On that list, DU, or depleted uranium. There have been a number of studies of misperceptions by viewers that many Americans believe that there was an Al-Qaeda Iraq connection, that many Americans believe that there were Iraqi hijackers attacking the World Trade Center. I think that's part of the campaign. Uh, it was very conscious effort uh, to use terms that would have people connect in their minds Iraq and the incident of 9-11. You, you imply that these are the same kind of people, and if they're the same kind of people, they must have had something to do with it. To threaten us. Threaten us. Had they done an hour's worth of research, they could have had a paragraph in their story which said, the Pentagon said this, however, uh, there were no however paragraphs. The new information dominance strategy worked thanks to advice from marketing experts, Hollywood producers, and communication specialists like John Rendon, who were monitoring the media worldwide. Their job was to keep the public well propagandized. That there were five wars uh, in Iraq. Uh, there, were the, the, there really was the reality of combat operations from the air, on the ground, and from the sea. The second war was the war the United States saw. Uh, the third war was the war that uh, Europe saw. Uh, the fourth war was the war uh, that Arab audiences saw. And the fifth war was the war the rest of the world saw. And as we monitored that in, uh, in real time, we, we found that none of them were ever in alignment. When you look at the war in Iraq, it's at times impossible to separate media, CIA, public relation firms, uh, government propaganda. It all came together. What, what, what is the problem here, Danny? 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 So what's the problem here? I'm at the Fox News Channel. 
Inside Fox and Friends, a program I will monitor every morning. It's been the most extreme in its coverage of the war. I'm waiting for the makeup lady to come. I'm going on the air to talk about a conspiracy that happened uh, 40 years ago, the Kennedy assassination. I made a film about that. Fox is not interested really in the conspiracy that's happening now in terms of the media, uh, the military, and the administration. But that's not the subject they have me here to talk about. The past somehow can be handled safely. Uh, the present is another matter. Well, you know what they say, the Fox is like not really fair and balanced, that it's really not even news. You know, do you watch it? No. No? <laughs> don't scratch your face. I'm sorry. Because you're... you're the third person I've talked to who said they don't even watch it and they work here. You just like deal with what's on top of people's heads, right? Right. You don't deal with what's <laughs> in their heads, right? <laughs> Truth does have a way of coming out, and sometimes it's suppressed for a long time. New documents emerge, historians uh, uh, reveal things that weren't revealed before. I believe so. I believe the American people deserve the truth. Now, where does Bill sit? I had hoped to confront Bill O'Reilly, but he wasn't there. He's one of the loudmouth talk show hosts that defined Fox's angry white man attitude, well calculated as a tool of polarization politics, long practiced on right-wing radio. After a year of uncritical reporting, to his credit, he admitted that he was wrong about WMDs. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I have come not to bury Rupert Murdoch, but to praise him. Full, fair, and balanced coverage. The Fox News Channel. Fox News may seem a fun place to its fans and a cartoon to its critics, but its ideological zeal is serious and carefully calculated, as longtime former producer Charlie Reyna revealed on a media website. Quote, the roots of Fox News Channel's day-to-day on-air bias are actual and direct. They come in the form of an executive memo distributed electronically each morning, addressing what stories will be covered and often suggesting how they should be covered. The memo is the Bible. Fox's response? This charge is unfounded. People want to work here. Fox coverage included overly dramatic reports by Geraldo Rivera and Iran-Contra conspirator Colonel Oliver North. I will tell you right now, counsel, and all the members here gathered, that I misled the Congress. Colonel North's war stories were blatant exercises in cheerleading and denounced the anti-war movement. This is the city garbage dump. I wonder where all the peace protesters never protest this kind of stuff. Terrorists could be planning to attack Westerners overseas. What was called the Fox effect drove all the TV coverage to the right. No network wanted to be accused of being unpatriotic. Arnett gave an interview to Iraqi television in which he criticized American war planning and said his reports about civilian casualties in the Iraqi resistance were encouraging to anti-war protesters in America. The American war planners misjudged the determination of the Iraq. Veteran correspondent Peter Arnett was targeted by Fox News for his decision to say on Iraqi TV what he was already saying on MSNBC. The of the if I'm wrong, you didn't go on Iraqi TV to say, I support Saddam Hussein, did you? Uh, you didn't endorse one side or the other. I didn't endorse one side. But it, it was part of the hysteria that was that had developed surrounding this war. Now, there's a degree of hysteria about every war that America participates in and in, 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 gets involved in, and this was part of the hysterical reaction, and I was basically, you know, just swept up in that incredible explosion of anger. I think there were 157 cartoons of me in the newspaper the next morning, most of them in bed with Saddam Hussein. Management called up and says, look, the pressure is too great. We've had thousands of emails and calls, and it's time we, we have to drop you. What I've learned and has gone unreported until now is that those emails were not from the public at large, but part of an orchestrated campaign by Free Republic, a right-wing online network. 
We were freaked, an official at National Geographic told me, explaining that 20,000 emails calling Arnett a traitor bombarded their executives, who then panicked and discharged him. The Freepers boasted of their success. Before the war, NBC fired popular anti-war talk show host Phil Donahue, replacing him with strident right-wingers in a move to outfox Fox. An MSNBC executive called Fox the patriotism police. The rest of the world looked at my firing you know, is, 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 a, is a, you know, another example of American media caving into government. What about Al Jazeera in that, publishing those gruesome pictures of dead soldiers? I think there's something that is, that is culturally Arab about that. Good news. Fair, balanced, and unafraid. But all of the networks more or less signed on to the official rationale. A study found widespread misperceptions among viewers. The people with the most misinformation watched the Fox News channel, although viewers of other channels were also receptive to inaccuracies. Public broadcasting viewers and listeners were misled the least. This Canadian study highlights another misperception about the media itself. Quote, most Americans were not aware of how one-sided and biased the coverage had been. They believed the news media had served the country well. Nothing like this has happened. The war in Iraq continues, and no one takes you closer than CNN. In this war, what had once been known as the CNN effect had faded, but CNN was still a news leader. I learned that CNN mounted two news teams, one for the U.S. channel and one for the rest of the world on CNN International. Was it just different strokes for different folks? Explain to me why CNN had one type of coverage for America and one type for the rest of the world. Um, I'm not so sure it was different. The content was the same. Uh, the presentation sometimes is different. Uh, American audiences have certain expectations of how the news is given to them. You know, people aren't going to hang out on the screen forever and watch what you, you know, what your long explanations. They want to know quickly what's happened because they have a job to do too, and. You know, that's what our job is to give them that. For me, it's, it's a huge difference to, to, to be able to get international news. Uh, one of the benefits I had living in Atlanta was I was there in the heart of an international newsroom. As soon as I stepped outside, domestic media never gave me that. Uh, it's a real shame, actually, especially for the world's most powerful nation. <laughs> In just three weeks, the U.S. military seized Baghdad with a small army of journalists tagging along. Robert Pelton, operating unilaterally now, observed the network news operations. When you're a journalist in Baghdad, you live in a fancy hotel, you're, you're, you're hooked to the Internet all the time. You've got people in New York making decisions for you, sending you story ideas that you are going to go out and do. Uh, you get up in the morning, you've got a driver, you've got an air-conditioned GMC, you've got a driver, a translator, a cameraman, you get a security guy, a little kind of British guy with tattoos on his arms, and off you go to shoot the story. You know, you put your vests on, get your sound bites, you come back in time to cut it together, and then the talking head does the stand-up, boom, off it goes. Goodbye, sit down. Thanks to a recently released U.S. Army report, we now know this most dramatic image of the Iraq War was engineered by a psychological operations unit that made it seem like it was spontaneous. Many TV outlets reported their stunt as evidence of the freedom, which was now said to be Iraq's. Mission accomplished, proclaimed President Bush in a scene out of the movie Top Gun. Washington Post military reporter Tom Ricks disagreed with this assessment. I think the single biggest media failure um, was a failure that the Bush administration committed and the media committed together, which is we all tore, tore down the goalposts at halftime. Um, on April 9th, we said game over. It turned out the game was half over. The post-invasion storyline quickly changed from liberation to occupation to resistance. There was massive looting. 
There were pro-Saddam protests and daily attacks on U.S. soldiers. Almost none of the invasion coverage anticipated this post-war chaos. While some TV crews remained, most of the embeds were withdrawn, upsetting military commanders like we Scott Rudder. You know, 15 April, when everyone left, a new breed came over. These individuals uh, were not part of the war, very excited about getting the information, getting it there. On the Sheraton Hotel, as well as the Palestine Hotel, you can imagine um, huddles of reporters around high-paid taxi cab drivers to launch out, to get the story, to show up in your unit without any type of any type of coordination or efforts. You can imagine them huddling around a Bearcat scanner for the bad news. The search for WMDs was getting nowhere fast. No one asked me to come here and fight for someone. So, well, you know what? Because half my company doesn't even own a car. You know why we came here and fought? We came here and fought for all the beautiful ladies back home and a nice cold Coke. That's why we're here kicking off in somebody's butt. Thanks a lot. <laughs> By year's end, when no WMDs were found, officials called it a moot point and sought to change the subject. By then, the post-war war claimed more American lives than the invasion. Stephen Marshall of Guerrilla News Network went to Baghdad in October 2003. Each of the major networks has sort of one crew who, who travel around from bomb site to bomb site. It's all sort of guarded by the military with huge checkpoints and, you know, concrete barriers, which doesn't give them an opportunity to cover what I would call the Arab street or, you know, the, the, the true um, sort of experience of the Iraqi people. The reporting from Iraq quickly degenerated into a catalog of incidents. What's really happening now is you have a situation where there's a bombing, a suicide bombing, say, at the, ho at the Baghdad Hotel, where we were at. And all of a sudden, you know, everyone gets in their truck and whips over there with their security guards, and everyone's on scene. I mean, most of the people who are there are sort of adventure journalists. They're, they're the guys who, you know, really, they're stringers, who get paid quite a lot of money to go and work in these countries, and they're simply there to get the, the best pictures they can. And in many ways, I found it to be very cynical. You know, you, we met a lot of photographers and shooters who were really there, and all they wanted to do was find the next disaster, get there on time, get the right footage, get back to the Palestine Hotel and start drinking beer. I mean, you know, it really, it's, you know, in Iraq, it's, the, it's the, the truism, it's never been more absolute, that if it bleeds, it leads. The only thing they want to get out of Iraq are, are bloody civilians or, in, in, in the best case scenario, military officials or military or soldiers who've been hit by bombs. That's the images they want to get, which is ironic because the administration, for the administration, those are the worst types of images. And then Saddam Hussein was captured. Time magazine took Jesus off of its cover and put Saddam on. Every network played it big, as if it was the second coming. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. The footage was supplied by the Pentagon. It was a major propaganda coup for Washington, even though it was later reported in the region that it was the Kurds, not the U.S. military, who first found the Iraqi leader in that hole. Inside a small walled compound. This is a picture of an Iraqi prisoner of war. And the pornography the of violence America, took an unexpected turn when these prison photos surfaced, showing abuses by U.S. soldiers of detainees in a notorious Iraqi gulag. CBS broke the story in late April 2004, but also admitted holding it up at the Pentagon's request for two weeks. Their report permitted a U.S. general to shift blame onto a few individuals without exploring the systemic abuse documented in a military investigation. We're appalled as well. These are our fellow soldiers. These are the people we work with every day. They represent us. They wear the same uniform as us, and they let their fellow soldiers down. CBS's report aired in the end of April. By early July, the Pentagon had still not released its full investigation or its torture videos, and the press was no longer pressing them to do so. Why did it take so long for the story to surface? I later found this video of the same prison shot by Amnesty International in July 2003. They were alleging torture then. Uh, we've documented or heard allegations of uh, mistreatment or torture of prisoners. While most of the world was shocked by the pictures, administration supporters were minimizing the well-documented torture. It was like a, a college fraternity prank to stack up naked Exactly! Men and, but it, but it was, exactly my point!
The war is still going on. Its outcome is still undetermined. The United States has not won this war. The war you saw depended on where you lived. The Arab world saw a different war than the one we did. Ironically, many U.S. networks relied on Arab outlets, Al Jazeera, Abu Dhabi TV, and other networks for footage of the bombings. They showed their coverage stripped of their narrative. Al Jazeera financed its coverage with fees paid by U.S. networks. They were surprised by bombardment before sunrise. The addition of Al Jazeera this time around was as powerful and important as the addition of CNN to the rest of the world in 1991. Al Jazeera was formed by former BBC journalists as a commercial satellite channel. It promotes itself dramatically and was fiercely committed to offering diverse perspectives, although in the U.S. and Britain, it was falsely denounced as a one-sided propaganda organ. Its correspondents were often brave and took risks. They saw themselves as independent and balanced, although their style was much hotter and more audacious than their Western counterparts. Before 9-11, many government-controlled uh, networks used or newspapers used to call Al Jazeera the Israeli CIA-backed network uh, because we put Israeli officials on the air, we, we invite Americans, we, we put Bush more than any other leader in the Arab world. So we were suspected to be the Israeli people uh, are trying to divide the Arab world, opposition against the government. And the, the media was so positive about us before 9-11 here. But immediately after we put the bad guys for America as for the balance, they behaved the same way that the other uh, government controlled the media and the Arab world were doing to us. The Arab media also was debating the coverage. For a deeper understanding of their perspectives, I went to Dubai in the Gulf region. Welcome to the Arab Media Summit. Hundreds of journalists from around the region debated coverage issues, often disagreeing with each other and their Western colleagues. It was there I met TV anchor Nima Abu Warda. She rose to challenge CNN correspondent Nick Robertson. Now, my second comment is to you, in fact, uh, of CNN, re regarding Amanpour's um, comment. Amanpour said that CNN was muzzled. She talks of an atmosphere of, of uh, fear of reporting on what's going on, um, of collusion, perhaps, is, is what she's insinuating between the Bush government and CNN. That's absolutely not what she said. Th those were private comments she made outside of CNN. These were comments made on a TV program, I understand. Outside, outside of CNN. But it's not private when it's on television, live television. Thank you very much. Let, Halid, let me answer your, bring up your first point. You think he was uncomfortable talking about it? Oh, extremely uncomfortable. He turned away. I, I was going to say, are you gagging me? Because that's exactly what he did. He dismissed me. I was dismissed. Uh, squat, you know, just swatted like a, a fly on the wall. Nima told me about the TV coverage of the war she watched. I would flick English, Arabic, Arabic, English, and you'd be comparing and contrasting stories and just seeing the angles and what was being said. Because ultimately, you get different... Uh, stories from the different perspectives. On the Arabic TV stations, I would see what war is really like, the blood and gore, the mess that really happens when a bomb hits a building. 10% are so-called dumb bombs. On, on CNN, you would see more of the strategic stuff. The viewer in this part of the world thought that only one side or a lopsided version of the war was being given. We are refugees going from one place to the other, and we can't reach our homes. We came from Umm al-Qasr, and God knows what happened in Umm al-Qasr. Look what is happening to us. Look at my children. One of the things that's missing is indigenous voices to freely and openly be shown, be allowed to appear. But you don't get people from the area really given proper uh, hearing. 
People have to take responsibility. There is a moral responsibility. I think journalists have to take more of that burden, more of that responsibility. It is your profession, your chosen profession after all. Journalists and media workers were targeted in Iraq. Was it deliberate to keep the story on message by intimidating non-embedded journalists? How did the media industry challenge these killings? Some were killed by so-called friendly fire. Others, victims of calculated attacks, missiles, tank shells, and bombs dropped on or near journalists. Some media critics concluded it was intentional, although the Pentagon denied it. Before the war, the BBC's Kate Aidy reported she was told by the Pentagon that independent journalists could be targeted. The Arab Media Center in Baghdad, whose coordinates had been given to the Pentagon, was bombed. Al Jazeera's Tariq Ayyub, seen here sitting on a roof, watched the plane that would soon kill him come closer and closer. Welcome. A U.S. tank shelled the Palestine Hotel, which is crowded with journalists, killing two cameramen. One of them works for a Spanish network, and the other one works for Reuters. Now another incident. Look at this. An American tank on the bridge across from the Palestine Hotel in Baghdad. A soldier would later claim his tank was fired on. Listen carefully. There are no sounds. Was removed to the Palestine Hotel because the Pentagon asked our organizations to let us leave the Rashid Hotel because it was a target. And when we moved to the Palestine Hotel, our organization told the Pentagon that we were at the Palestine Hotel. So did every news organization. Again, minutes later, no sounds were heard, no one firing at U.S. soldiers. Suddenly, without provocation. Suddenly we saw an orange glow, and this is basically the shell, tank shell that hit our office. And you know, you, you can imagine panic, we were wounded, it was me and another photographer. I can't imagine that they would target journalists, you know. I couldn't believe why would they target us, you know. What, what have we done to them? After the war, press freedom groups were still demanding a real investigation. The Pentagon's Victoria Clark told me there was a report that showed that the soldiers were acting in self-defense. Is there any attempt to find out the facts uh, independently or a thorough investigation? No, the Pentagon never interviewed me personally, or I don't think any of our colleagues were, were interviewed by the Pentagon. Samia's company, Reuters, demanded an independent investigation, but most media companies did not even press on this issue. No one was held accountable. It was all passed off as an accident, the fog of war and all that. So what about damage to you personally? I was hit in the brain. I had a brain operation, and it took me a long time to recover. But, you know, I was blessed. I, I survived. But it was, you know, emotional damage and uh, physical damage. But, you know, the emotional also, you know, because I lost a colleague. We covered a war together, and suddenly he was next to me, and he died. The debate about the killing of journalists continues. The respected media historian Philip Knightley concluded 
I believe that the occasional shots fired at media sites are not accidental and that war correspondents may now be targets. The media war had drawn blood. If you want to know why the war was packaged and reported the way it was, you have to know something about our American media system. It's a system dominated by just a handful of companies, and they're all around me here in the chaos of Times Square. All the big brands, MTV, Viacom, Bertelsmann, ABC, NBC, Reuters, they surround me physically. What they represent is the power of media power to promote economic and political agendas. What they represent today is a merger of news biz and show biz. What they represent is a consumer culture. To them, the war was a product. They sold it, and we bought it. Most networks remain uncritical of their coverage. NBC won the U.S. media wars, the highest rated NBC network. NBC's coverage on broadcast, on cable, was simply worth it. The network celebrated its victory in Iraq with a party in the posh Rainbow Room in a building named after a general, General Electric, their parent company. They released a book and DVD on the war for Iraqi freedom. Anchor Tom Brokaw paid tribute to a popular correspondent, David Bloom, who died in Iraq. I'm so proud of the men and women of NBC News who had the common bond of courage and determination to go into the heart of darkness. I caught up with Tom Brokaw at the Museum of Radio and Television. I asked a question from the floor. I want to go to the audience now, if we can. Danny Schechner, I know, has a question right down here in front. We might as well get it out of the way. How could the media, your institution particularly, have done a better job of being a little bit more skeptical and a little bit more critical? Well, I, uh, I think your suggestion is that we... <laughs> I think your suggestion is that we took the pipe, and if you go back and review the coverage on network television, Mr. Rick's newspaper, Wall Street Journal, uh, the New York Times, certainly, and any other publication in this country, during that very vigorous time of the UN debate, for example, there were lots of other voices that were heard, great skeptical voices, but many times people hear what they're inclined to hear. And the idea that somehow it's packaged and spun back in the corporate headquarters to, to fit some sort of greater agenda, I personally find outrageous and oh, ridiculous. Well, listen, I'm not being conspiratorial because sure. I worked at ABC News for eight years. Right. So I've been in the control rooms, I've been involved, I worked at CNN before that. I'm not making this up. I'm not inventing it. There, there is clearly, there was clearly an approach. There was an identification uh, by much of the American media with the American military. I think that's sort of undeniable. How can you even deny that? I mean, if you look at the critics and, and how many I critics can't speak there to, were. I, all I can say is I can't speak for the entire American media. I also Talk I don't think I'm talking for ABC. Talk I think that ABC. we told it straight ahead. More Americans get their news from ABC News. There was a suit here who I spoke to, a vice president of ABC News. Oh, really? And, you know, he was very, you know, they criticize us on the left, they criticize us on the right, so therefore we must be doing it the right way. In other words, you know, it's a kind of conventional knee-jerk response. I use that line myself, I can't tell you how many times. <laughs> but what's missing from it? Is it true? I mean... Well, the dead bodies are missing from it. ABC News. Unique. Brave. Provide. Remember, Disney does not want ABC to be in the news business. It's so much pressure on these news organizations to be something not rock the boat, not be a problem. The Pentagon is following the planning it matters and has the latest on a Saddam possible timeline. Outside of Basra, Saddam the effort to keep the survive. supply lines running uh, north toward Baghdad. One of the reasons safely, I think that media fell so easily into this, this pattern war, of selling so. the war is that that really is what the American media is designed to do, is to sell things. It's a commercial media, it's a propaganda system, and everyone knows it.
Our system of broadcast media is regulated by the FCC, a government agency originally set up to protect the public interest. Today, that regulatory body promotes deregulation, more power to media moguls. The head of the FCC justifies media concentration on the grounds that only big companies can cover a war like the one in Iraq. Just before the war in Iraq began, American media companies began lobbying the FCC for rule changes that would benefit their bottom lines. There was a question raised. Did the FCC agree to waive the rules if the media companies agreed to waive the flag? You don't go in and report critically on an administration that you hope will give you billions and billions of dollars in uh, new policies. We've been in this business long enough to be very careful, but I'm, I'm sure they were uh, waiting for a deal and we're hoping that being supportive of the war would get them the deal. Remember what Rupert Murdoch did when he was in, uh, in China. He was the only one defending China despite all the abuses of human rights because he was uh, working on a TV deal with, uh, which he eventually got in China. The reason the coverage in part was so tepid, was so timid, was because these same media companies like News Corp, Fox, GE, NBC, Viacom, CBS were trying to curry favor to win the support of the Bush administration for this huge giveaway on media ownership. This is not something that happened yesterday. It didn't happen overnight. It's been going on here in the United States for about two decades at least. And it's been a process. It's been an organized, concerted, thought-out, well-planned, and well-executed process. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. Going back to the Reagan administration, flowing through the first Bush administration, and now being picked up successfully so far by the second Bush administration. Power generally, not just media power, power tends to go with power. Primarily, they want to support whoever's in the White House. They want to support government. They want to support large, other large corporate interests. They, they don't want to rock the boat, uh, generally. This is a plan. It's a plan. It's not serendipitous. It doesn't happen accidentally. It's what they want. They want to be able to control the political discussion. Who was the FCC commissioner with whom they were trying to curry favor, uh, who was uh, acting on their behalf during this period. Uh, it was Michael Powell, the son of Colin Powell. The evils of media consolidation will never get past our fortifications. I think it was very clear that the major media companies in this country had business before the government. Boom. It's a conflict of interest. In my day, uh, there was no, there was, a, there was really a wall between news and the rest of the organization. It becomes sort of a... You scratch my back, I scratch your back. Did you see any coverage on television about the whole controversy, about the FCC and the new rules? I mean, there was hardly any to speak of. I, there must have been some somewhere that I missed, but it was so minor and so ineffectual in terms of informing the public what's going on. Well, people need to try to take back the airwaves. They need to try to restore democracy to the airwaves. Iraq quickly became the apocalypse I feared, as ghosts of the crimes of Vietnam seemed to be coming back to haunt us. All over the world, people came to see the United States not as heroic liberators, but brutal occupiers. I found these graphics stenciled on the walls of Barcelona. I saw how media outlets suppress scrutiny of policies, preferring to show images rather than expose interests. Major media covers the world through the eyes of those in power, downplaying the brutal impact of war and its own role in promoting it. In July 2004, a Senate committee blasted the CIA for misreporting on WMDs in Iraq. It criticized what it called group think. Couldn't the same phrase be applied to other WMDs, media weapons of mass deception? The lesson is don't trust the mainstream media. If you want to really find out what's happening, uh, you can't be a news consumer. You have to be a critical thinker. 
TV is not the same, it's not the same medium it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. You don't really have the luxury of providing detailed analytical coverage of a war. You basically get an eyeball shot and that's it. It's one thing to talk about this war, but as you look to the future, uh, if you didn't like this, you're really not going to like what's going to come, come down the road the next time. Just as there's an investigation now into the failure of the intelligence community, we need an investigation into the failure of our journalistic community. Media hasn't really been taken to task at all. There is no uh, global watchdog that's saying, you didn't do your job well. Media people seem to, to be more comfortable uh, repeating the words of politicians, repeating statements that come out in press, etc., than actually probing and trying to find out what it really means. Is it true? Is it true? Can we fight back against deceptive news and massive media concentration? Can we fight back against jingoism posing as journalism? Can we afford not to fight back? Should they, you know, use a Moab, the mother of all bombs? I joined the media to spotlight the problems of the world, came to see that the media is one of those problems. I believe in freedom of the press, but not just freedom for those who own the press. What can we do to hold the media more accountable? Think about it. Now I've had my say. It's your turn. The whole thing's being treated like infotainment. The outcome is, is assured. This is a spectacle for consumption. They don't report anything that is in any way critical of Bush. And that's worse than Goebbels and World War II. And I'm from Germany. I know how Goebbels treated the war. President Bush declared the major combat had come to an end. My fellow Americans, major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. I need to know the honest truth I need to know. I cannot help but think of all